Hi, everyone. My name is Shabir Musa. I'm a family physician in Soweto. Um, this is the uh, CPD meeting of the Johannesburg Health District. Um, we are broadcasting it uh, on Zoom as well as Facebook. Um, we're really pleased to have uh, in our uh, panel today uh, a team from uh, the University of uh, Cape Town and uh, other universities in, uh, in Cape Town. So there's a team, team from Cape Town led by Klaus von Preston. Um, he's got Tassim Ras, Ronit Oken, and Steve Reed, um, who are going to share um, different aspects of the work that is being done in the COVID-19 field, field hospital uh, in Cape Town called the Hospital of Hope. It's actually in the Cape Town International Convention Center. I think there's some really great stuff that is happening in that space, and uh, we're really eager to listen to Klaus and his colleagues uh, sharing with us they're all in the same room, um, so um, over to Klaus, and uh, hopefully you can add a little bit more to each uh, panelist as we go along. Klaus, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, Shabir. Good morning, colleagues. Thank you very much for the opportunity to join you today from a, a cold and rainy Cape Town. Um, so as, as alluded, we are a, a, a team presenting today. And uh, so, so, you, so people are on the, I don't know if you, I, I'm just yeah. gonna just, so, so this, uh, this, this, this Lim Ras, <laughs> Ronit Akun and Steve Reed. Um, so they've, they, we are sort of part of the clinical management slash learning team um, tasked to, with the operational side of, of the CTICC. And I want to also acknowledge um, our colleagues um, from the CTICC and the Metro Health Services, especially also disaster management and our emergency medicine colleagues, um, who were part of the commissioning phase and are still very uh, closely uh, involved with the, this field hospital as well as the other field hospital, which is going live probably in the next week at Brackengate, um, as well as the other um, facilities uh, that were, were created in response to this pandemic. Um, so I think we are, so, so each of us is going to talk to a, a, a certain area. I mean, the, I will give you a brief overview and then Taslim um, will give a more insight into the operational aspects of the, of the, of the facility. Um, Ronit is also a family physician and her focus is on the staff safety and wellness. And uh, Professor Steve Reed, um, is is uh, bringing uh, in some some perspectives about, about how we uh, strive to create a learning culture within the team. So, so just briefly, as as mentioned, this facility is 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 a not uh, is it has been repurposed to become a field hospital or an alternative care site for the COVID pandemic. Um, you you may see here they at the, at the bottom of the top photo. Uh, is the CTICC, which consists of three, four big halls. Um, and at present, we're using the fourth and third hall within the facility. And uh, most likely, we will also extend into the other parts of the facility. Um, it has been officially opened by the president, and we started having our first patients from the 8th of June. So it's just about a month now that we've been, been active. And as you can see from this slide at the top, this is the number of referrals in from the acute um, hospital platform. Um, these referrals come through, through the Vula referral app. Um, and from those uh, close to a thousand referrals, we've um, uh, admitted close to 850. Um, and of, of those 630 have been discharged so far, uh, 14 of, of the admissions had to be transferred out again um, in terms of escalation of care. And in this period, we also had 41 deaths, um, most of them um, anticipated, unfortunately. And the average length of stay was 4.3 days. Um, and I want to also credit uh, Dr. Vanessa Naidu from UCT Emergency Medicine and the Disaster Management Response Team for these slides. So you, you can see that about 50% or half of the patients um, admitted uh, we're in the 50 to 70 age group. So this is, uh, is in keeping probably with the, the other um, 
insights from from across the race of South Africa and globally. Um, we the you may see uh, I don't know if you can see the there was one patient that was over the age of 100, 104 to be exact, and she actually uh, was discharged safely back home, so she's doing well. Um, so that that's just a spectrum of the patients that were admitted, and as mentioned, um, most patients actually stay. Uh, uh, with, with go home within a week of, of being admitted, um, with the average length of stay being 4.3 days. Um, and I want to hand over now to Taslim, who can speak to the next and he's dutifully applying uh, hand sanitizer. So we, we have strict IPC measures in place. Yeah, want to be in the seat. <laughs> Good morning, colleagues. Um, and uh, thanks, Shabir, for this opportunity to share some of our experiences. I'm just going to speak very briefly to uh, some of our structural issues in how we, we are running the, the facility. Um, so the first little organogram I put up there is with the CEO of clinical nursing and admin functions um, who are kind of who form the executive committee of the facility. The bulk of what I, want to, what I want to show on this slide is the clinical component, which is our team, the clinical management team, and the components that we manage. So the medical components, which are the doctors, uh, the pharmacists, uh, radiography services, physiotherapy teams, and the dietitians. Just to, to summarize each of those teams, we have uh, eight doctor teams, uh, each of them having six members who are medical officers led by a consultant. Now the consultants, we call them consultants, but uh, three of them are family medicine registrars, senior registrars, and three family medicine consultants. We have two uh, emergency medicine consultants and one internal medicine consultant. Now, the reason I put that on the slide is because the mix is quite important. Uh, we need a variety of skilled people on the floor who will lead clinical services. And as the next slide is going to show you, uh, the, the burden of disease to a certain extent uh, demands that we have multi-skilled teams on the floor. The second group I wanna talk about are the physios at the moment. We have seven physios. Now, initially we started working with these physios working as an isolated team and re re getting referrals from the doctor teams. We found that when we started allocating a physio to a doctor team, that the, the integration of the physio and the physiotherapy services into, into the uh, services became much smoother. Yeah. And we started looking at an, integ at an integrated service uh, model. Uh, so it was integration on the floor. Uh, the, the, the third group I wanna talk about are the dietitians. Now the dietitians, uh, initially we were thinking, wow, what a nice to have, but they've become an integral part around planning patient menus. Uh, especially when it, when it comes to the fact that a very large proportion of our patients have uh, diabetes. Uh, one of the main chronic drivers in terms of the comorbidities of, of these patients is diabetes, as, as most of you would know already. Uh, these dietitians are also available uh, for individual consultations. However, uh, so much of the work is, is, is spent on an organizational level. If you saw the numbers that Klaus just presented, you'll understand that organizing uh, appropriate diets for each of these patients uh, is going to be very important. And what they've managed to do, quite interestingly, is to link the Clinicom system, which is the information management system, which describes which, which patients are, are in the facility and what type of services they need. They've linked the Clinicom system to the meals ordering system so that the chef in the kitchen has direct access to the list of diabetic patients. And that's been a major move forward in terms of efficiency for us. In terms of x-ray services, we have two mobile units which are linked to the PAC system so that uh, doctors can see the x-rays um, virtually at, at any of the computer terminals in the facility. I think importantly, um, we, the, the main challenge with the x-rays, and I think people need to think about if you have mobile units, is the availability of Wi-Fi. And if there are multiple devices operating on the Wi-Fi network at any given point in time, that challenges the system. And I think just to add, which is not on this slide, as I'm thinking, as I'm talking, I'm thinking, is that we have a one point of care ultrasound machine which is operational on the floor, 
which is uh, being used by the family medicine consultants and the EM consultants. This is a pretty busy slide. I don't need to go through it uh, in detail. The, the main reason I put it here, so this is a, a, uh, a working document which we, which we developed in week two of, our, of being functional. Um, when we did the planning document on who would be admitted, it was basically based on uh, COVID severity. However, as soon as we started seeing patients, we realized that uh, comorbidity, the second group over here, is actually our largest group. And there was also a large need of the, of the acute platform for us to take patients with palliative care needs. Now, why this slide is important is because it projects the type of workload whether it's medical acuity or nursing acuity that each group of patients would need. And it helped us think about our ratios, staff to patient ratios. So just, just to give you a, some sense, category one up here was about 20%. Category three was about 20% of our total patient load. And category two remains about 60% of our total patient load. So the clinical complexity takes most of the workload that we're seeing at the moment. So from, from uh, some of the key lessons that, that we've learned uh, from the operational side is that uh, your staffing ratios are one of the key constraints to so identify them early. We initially were planning within our components and very quickly we learned that we needed to have early, in-depth, detailed conversations with nurse management because actually our, our earliest constraint, which has only begun to be resolved in the last week or so, has been nurse management at an operational level. So operational nurse managers were our main constraint. Um, we cannot be uh, inflexible about our SOPs and our practices uh, being a field hospital. And I call this, we are in perpetual draft format. The other important thing is supply chain issues. This, was a, this remains a huge challenge. Initially, when we started up the facility, there was lots of collaboration. And after the honeymoon phase, about three weeks, we're now in competition with other facilities. There's a single depot from which we're getting our supplies and other hospitals are as in need as we are. And so I think this is just a dynamic conversation that people need to be aware of. And then the last important thing is that clinical governance in maintaining the quality of care is fundamentally important. Now that doesn't only apply to intra-facility conversations that we're having consistently that Steve will talk about but also inter-facility communication. And one of the biggest coups that we were able to pull off is that we have this fantastic inter-facility communication, which has been facilitated by uh, disaster management via the emergency medicine colleagues. Um, a huge step forward in the sense that on a, on a daily basis, we're able to measure pressures across the acute platform and look at where capacity is and direct services towards those areas. Thanks. Hello, my name is Ronit Oakham, lovely to be here, to be present, and I have a lot of appreciation to be part of such a, an amazing project of, of this nature in, in, in the times we're facing. So the role I've been playing <clears throat> is employee safety, infection control and PPE, which ties up with employee wellness and experience and satisfaction as well as assisting with patient experience and satisfaction. And just to say, I came on board three weeks ago when the hospital had already been erected and already one week into being open. So I had to get moving at from the get-go, from the day one. There was no time to waste. But I realized too that to, to, set, to, to give you the context um, from the, for the environment that we were facing with the staff is, as you are aware, stressful environment for everyone. South Africa and the world, a lot of uncertainties. The staff coming on board here put themselves in harm's way, a high risk job for themselves, possibly taking the virus home to families, loved ones. The COVID ward is a very cold environment. Everyone is covered from head to foot, wearing masks. There are no relatives for the patients, so everyone is alone there. It's, a very, it's quite a lonely place. There's no, usually the, the staff can take a break, go to a tea room and chat and to talk about how the day is going and that there's nothing like that on the floor. <clears throat> there's no toilets also for the staff and they can't drink or eat on the floor. That only happens um, after their long time at work and then they go off the floor and have a break. 
and the staff are faced with, with, with um, witnessing suffering and dying of, of more patients than they would on a regular basis, or so some of them haven't experienced it before. Uh, also, everyone is new there. Uh, everyone was recruited new, people don't know each other. It's a new place, totally new processes, no time to build organizational culture, no time to settle in. So that is the context with which everyone is working. However, we are aware that everyone here has chosen to be here for one reason or another. Some of them are financial uh, and others are for the common purpose. Firstly, safe working environment, PPE, ensuring organization, organization values their well-being. So I work with the infection control nurse, assisting her along the way. Infection control measures have been put in across the board. Pre-screening checklists for staff upon arrival. Upskilling and training of staff, there's a lot of junior staff. Um, a lot of other staff on the floor which are not medical staff, they need to be aware of how to maintain infection control. Um, addressing their concerns, adequate supplies, this is a constant battle to keep up with the, uh, as Tasleen said, supply chain. Um, across the country, there's a shortage of head coverings and foot coverings. Scrubs, there's a, a per shift, about a thousand scrubs um, we go through. Um, so to maintain that level of, of demand is challenging. And so it's a really a constant engagement with staff how to ensure that our, their needs are met. We, we, there is an outpouring of love and there are donations. And just heard this morning that head coverings, we're going to get a donation of that and uh, gum boots are actually are going to be donated. So we, we are very fortunate about that. So regarding the, regarding su support for the staff, looking at psychosocial support, there, one area of, of tremendous importance is the daily huddles, the check-ins. This is on a small, this happens in the middle groups. For example, there are team leaders in the, for physios, for pharmacy, for cons, the consultants have our team leaders of their, and they, they group meet with their medical officers. They have the operational managers that meet with them. You have the porters, the lead porter. You have the lead kitchen staff. They all are, they all are, are carrying out daily huddles. This enables staff to be supported opportunity to feel heard, to normalize their concerns, to feel that they're not alone, and to deal with unresolved conflict and get peer support. There is weekly training of these team leaders to facilitate their own huddles, to ensure that all staff are heard and met, and, and their needs met. There's, uh, and then for the staff themselves, uh, on a weekly basis, there's group debriefing. And this is, this is funded by the, the Department of Health, they, they've got employee wellness program and they will they send out on, on a needs basis um, counselors who will facilitate these group debriefings. Um, there's also individual counseling, um, either face-to-face -face or via Zoom. Um, the department is also offering training for various various topics, which over the course of time we are we will be um, booking. It's stress management, dealing with grief. And as well as classes like yoga, meditation, there's a 24 hour call center. Uh, we also in the process of putting in a buddy system where every staff member will have someone else that, that checks in with them and they, and, and vice versa. So that just on, on, a, on a smaller scale, um, everyone is, 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 is looking out for the next person. Um, I also visit the floor often and, and, and casually join ward rounds and engage with the staff and connect with them and, and meet them. Um, lastly, the Maslach Burnout Inventory this is a validated tool to assess occupational burnout, and we will be introducing that and, 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 and allowing staff to assess how they're doing themselves, as well as um, if they wish to, to um, return the tool and, and then we can uh, support them. So, other area, so, so as you see on the right, there's a, there's a picture called the Wellness Pit Stop. Now this is evolving and it's just come about and it's a very exciting creative space. And this will be, as you see, there's a suggestion box. So this is, this is kind of the main area where the staff come out and have their break. It's outside, there's a, a small kiosk and outside that, this is where the, it will be, loca it is located. So a suggestion box where staff can put in suggestions, concerns, um, we're going to get refreshments there. Um, there will be a notice board put up where they can find out about different wellness um, resources. We also will, we're going to have a wall behind, a wall of wellness, a wall of reflection, um, and a wall of expression where, 
where the, we'll get messages from the public, put up and uh, words of thank you to them. And it will be a place where staff can find out what exactly is going on in the facility and a place to connect and engage. Um, we've also been so fortunate, we've had outpouring of love and generosity from, from the public. And, and with that, there's been so much creativity come through um, in, in the sense of music, um, a song has been put together for, um, for, for the staff and, for the, to, and to use on the floor for the patients. Um, artwork is going to be displayed in this area. Um, someone wants to come and take photographs of the staff and, and display it in a collage. Uh, and it's just, it just it, it, an enormous amount of creativity is going and it will be all, all in this, located in this area in order to reach out to staff and improve their experience here and to connect with them on, on the levels that, that they require. And then the patient experience. So again, the, due to this wonderful generosity that we've experienced from the public, and we've got many donations, which I've been facilitating that. And so we've got packs made of toiletries, blankets, and a musician was here yesterday is putting a song together that we, that we will, we're going to play over the PA system. There might even be a concert um, played over the PA systems. It's all in the pipeline. And um, I'm involved with commun improving communication between the patient and the family, which is a key, um, it, which is so fundamental in an environment where um, there, there's no relatives and, there's, and, and the communication. Is, is, is so difficult as their families are at home. And there's a, we, have, we have got a patient liaison person on the floor who carries herself and going from floor to floor, brought from bed to bed, so I've been facilitating her role, as well as ensuring we have devices on the floor for patients to communicate with their loved ones. Thank you. Okay, my turn. Hi, everybody. Uh, Hi, Steve. Okay, I'm just going to talk very briefly about quality improvement in learning, which was designed from the start as an integral component of this, um, of this initiative. Um, and the important point, I think, is that it involves all the components, and even the management team has a weekly learning session scheduled. In fact, it's due to start in, an, in uh, three quarters of an hour's time. Uh, so fairly early on, we, we, we set up a schedule of weekly meetings. I'll show you in the next slide what it looks like. Um, so that the uh, reflection and learning, because we had to adapt so quickly, every day there was something new. Uh, certainly every week we were rethinking systems um, and we needed to have the space to, to think, okay, how, how does this shift things? Um, this, this idea of uh, standard operating procedures that that were good enough to start with. Um, so we had to deal with the, the death process. What happened? What do you do with the, with the, with the body? Um, the, and, and the relatives who clamoring to, to see the body at least and, and the, all the difficulties of actually getting a, a body out there and dealing with the uh, undertakers, etc. We had to have a good enough standard operating procedure to start with and then we were able to work on it incrementally. Likewise for the discharge process, which was a, which is a big issue in, in like week two, um, that just seemed crazy. We'd discharge patients and they'd still be lying around, sitting around eight hours later and we'd say, why didn't this patient go home? Well, um, we, we got that together. And then the uh, escalation process, uh, particularly on high flow nasal oxygen and, and the possibility of intubation, was quite a medical sort of process, which we have now got on top of, but we had to have a, a, a way of starting. And it is really important to have the participation of all the teams. Um, so, so no one could be in, in the process uh, could be left behind. Um, with the discharge process, for example, we had to involve pharmacy and transport and nursing and the medical teams and uh, the porters uh, so that so that the process could actually happen. Um, so this is what the uh, uh, weekly sort of schedule looks like. Um, most of the clinical teams have a, a short huddle in the morning. Um, the operational management team meets uh, uh, three times a week. We have visiting consultants now uh, at least three or four times a week, and. Um, 
the consultants get together each lunchtime uh, uh, three times a week with, and we've instituted the uh, multidisciplinary team meetings once a week and the uh, uh, maternal, uh, maternal uh, morbidity and mortality meeting uh, once a week uh, on, uh, um, at also at lunchtime. So the, uh, we got some um, uh, routine into the, into the end and, and um, systems into the uh, pipeline quite early on. And I think that really helped to um, create a system that people could anticipate and rely on as uh, uh, reflection spaces. Uh, we've, as family physicians, we found the lunchtime meeting particularly useful. Uh, often very unstructured, whatever came up, uh, a lot of operational issues and, and just a, a kind of open space to ventilate or, or sort a problem out or put something on the table. Um, so I think that was really important. Let me hand back to class then. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you, uh, Daslim, um, Ronald, and Steve. So, yeah. So, as as also like Steve has alluded to, is that I think part of the success, in a way, is is this generation of a of a learning culture. And uh, through these weekly meetings on a Friday, especially, we came up with this overall aim of the hospital. Um, to offer hope by delivering high quality, efficient inpatient care um, in response to the needs in the Cape Town Metropole, whilst ensuring the safety and positive growth of staff. And as you can uh, have learned perhaps from the previous um, uh, presenters, that each of us sort of have a, a key area, a key focus area to help achieve this aim. Obviously, in, 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 in in participation with our colleagues in the operational management team and, and the colleagues working on the floor. So this is just also one of the reflections from one of the uh, Nabila Amina, who is a family medicine registrar in her final year, who is also a clinical team leader. Um, and this was also featured recently on the UCT news page. And I, th and I think it sort of sums also up the that reflection um, and that experience from the floor. So the biggest assist that the team has had is that of starting something from scratch and managing to keep it running successfully with incredibly high standards of care. COVID is a disease that brings about anxiety and fears even among the strongest minus clinicians. It, at the CTICC Hospital of Hope, patients are still treated with compassion and respect. The amount of passion I have seen from the staff is absolutely incredible. So thank you. I think that's, we wanted to, to aim to, to speak uh, not too long to allow for enough time for Q&A. Well, thank you very much, Klaus. And uh, thanks to Taslim, Ronit, and Steve. I uh, really appreciate you all spending your time and energy to do this. Um, we also have on the panel um, Tom Boyles, who's uh, joining us. And uh, Tom is basically going to lead uh, the questions. I want to introduce Tom. He's an infectious disease specialist. He's been working with us in Johannesburg, and he's currently uh, clinically leading the um, the team or the the effort at uh, um, at uh, the Nazarek uh, um, sort of field hospital, but not quite. So let me just uh, hand over briefly to uh, Steve, and if he can uh, share a little bit about Nazarek, but I think really. Uh, to ask questions and clarify from you um, questions that he found quite challenging. So I think, uh, uh, Tom, you can take it from here. I think yeah. if we can focus on questions and using the opportunity to, to help us, um, you know, get the best we can from our colleagues in Cape Town. Okay, thanks, Shabir. So, sorry, I've got my daughter here because um, child care and no work problem. is a challenge at the moment. <laughs> um, <Wait>. I... <laughs> This is Maya. Um, I think she enjoyed the picture. So, look, I, I, that was very impressive. Um, the four of you, fantastic. Thank you. I, I think the, 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 we should start at the beginning. Um, the main difference between Western Cape and, and Hateng is that Western Cape appears to have competent managers, competent um, provincial 
system. And so all the things you presented, all the personnel you presented, you, yourselves, Klaus, Teslim, Ronit and Steve, don't exist here. Um, there is no team. Um, we don't even know. So, so and I'll just go back one step. So the Nazareth facilities is a similar to the CTICC. Um, they commissioned 500 beds. It's now 600 beds. Um, um, and that is ready, but it has no oxygen and it has essentially no doc. It has like basically one doctor at a time and 18 nurses. It's okay. She's okay. And it has, um, and that's it. 600 beds, one, basically one doctor at a time, 18 nurses in total, no oxygen. So it's a complete white elephant. It's a complete waste of time. Um, it's got 150 patients in there all well. Basically we're just preventing a little bit of infection by them not going home. Um, and so, um, we, so, so what we think has happened is that the MEC has commissioned another 800 beds in, in addition. What we don't know, and we've been pushing very hard, is for those 800 beds all to have oxygen and to actually have something a little bit like what you've got. And we don't even know if, if that commissioning has happened because we're not able to communicate with the MEC or anybody. But we... In theory, that has been, that will be commissioned and will be ready in 30 days, but that's unlikely. The question, what we don't then, have, so then who's going to set that up? Who's going to turn that, those 800 beds with oxygen, if they exist, into what you've got? Questions we don't know. We don't haven't seen any adverts for staff. We're not part of that process. Um, we're just trying to get our foot in the door. So we think, I think, I've, I've kind of committed a month of my time to go to Nazareth. I would very much like to be in Klaus's position um, and have people around me and put something together. And I think with taking the lead from Cape Town, we could do that. We just don't have the, the province on our, we don't have anybody who's leading this, who is giving us the authority. You know, I'm not able to sit in a meeting with people and make a plan, you know, um, so it's extremely frustrating. And so that's the position we're in. I think we'd love to follow, even I think what we would want to just, we would aim low. Well, we could aim high, but I think I would suggest we would aim for, it would be lovely to have physios and dietitians and social workers and, and, and all those lovely things. But, you know, it's a crisis here. We're predicting the need for 800, 4,000 4, oxygenated beds. If we could just get oxygen to 800 people, um, keep them alive, give them, anticoagulation, steroids, proning, oxygen, chronic medications, food, you know, a telephone. Um, if we could just do that, that would be something that would keep people alive um, until we get a foot in the door. So this is Lynn Wilkinson, who many of you know, until we can get, somehow get a foot in the door and work out what's been commissioned, who's in charge. All we really know is there's, there's one retired CEO, Viz Naidu, who is basically running those 600 beds with 150 people in. Um, this is, this, you know, he, he's got some, some, um, skills. Um, but I don't think he's the right person to run an 800 bed facility, anything on the scale of, um, or at least be part of it, but you can't do it on his own. And so that's, I'll just leave you with that. That's the position we're in. Um, very frustrated, very much wanting to follow your lead. Um, but unable to get a foot in with the province. Well, thanks Tom. I think that, uh, you know, that's, yeah, I hope you, um, the team in Cape Town understands where we are at. So perhaps we can, uh, we can just dig in a little bit to what you're doing and see if we can unpick that uh, question that Tom is raising. What of what you're doing might we be able to use um, and how have you gone about this process? So perhaps, uh, you know, the, uh, understanding the bigger picture that, that we have in terms of making everything happen. Um, what is the situation in Cape Town in terms of the 800 beds that you'll have so far? Um, I'll, I assume they all have oxygen points. Um, thanks, Javier, and thanks, Tom, for that, uh, yeah. that brief. Can you perhaps describe what, you know, if I may, just quickly, um, what is the kind of situation you have as capacity to manage clinically uh, around each bed? And assuming that, you know, your your bed standard is, is almost the same. So that if we see, I mean, and you mentioned a little bit of your multimorbidity, the mix of patients that you have. So let's assume the biggest one is the multimorbidity that you're dealing with. What are the things around you 
that help you as a clinician to function? And what do you think is, uh, you know, essential and what's good to have depending on the acuity levels and how might you advise us managing that? So, so, so just a few things. The first is that uh, following on Tom's comments, I just want to say that, so we came on board about 10 days before the end of June, but the commissioning team had been functional since, since March already. So when, when, the, when, the, when the local authorities realized that we might have a problem, disaster management stepped in immediately. So this team only came on board. So it was initially just Klaus end and I. End of May. Yeah. yeah, end of May, Klaus and I came on board. And then Steve Reed came on board a little bit after that. And then Ronette Okun joined us a little bit after that. So the team that you see here wasn't the commissioning. We weren't part, really part of the commissioning process. I think that's an important comment to make. Yeah. We, we kind of uh, doing the operational management, but not the commissioning. The commissioning was, was, was run essentially by Lee Wallace, had, <coughs> excuse me, Lee Wallace and his team from disaster management. So I think if you're thinking about infrastructural development, that would be an important connection to make. And Lee has indicated his willingness to assist. He's even uh, said he's willing to jump on the plane and fly up to Joburg to help out as needed. So I think that's an important uh, comment to make about if you're thinking about piped oxygen. The second question from Shabir's point of view, uh, question is that at the moment, our capacity is not to run 800 beds. Our capacity, so we've had a cumulative amount of admissions of 850 over a one month period, but the amount of staff we have on the floor at the moment, which was our major constraint, allows us to run 400 beds as a total max. We can't go more than 400 beds at any one point in time. And when I mentioned on the slide earlier on about identifying your constraints, our main constraint here was the availability of operational managers for the nursing staff. For the first two weeks, we operated with minimal operational management and our actual management around the patient was quite chaotic because doctors were complaining that the nursing tasks were not being completed. The pharmacists were complaining that the, that the medication wasn't being handed out properly. And it's only when we got those operational managers on the floor that we started seeing a substantive improvement uh, despite our efforts. So I think you have to identify what your minimum team is. And as you plan opening beds, it is based on what you are able to deliver. Having a pie in the sky number of saying we 4,000 beds or whatever doesn't help you. What helps you is to identify what capacity you can deliver on. Once you have a basic unit of operation, which is how we started planning this. So we thought for every 64 patients, we need one operational manager, we need one medical team, and we need X amount of physios, et cetera, and the pharmacy team to support us. So we looked at units of 64 and then expanded from that. So one team allowed us to, and then we kind of expanded, and, and that's how we got to the number of 410. To be honest, 409.6 beds. <laughs> Kasim, just elaborate quickly on the, on the team. You said one operational manager. Can you just t tabulate that? What's the nursing um, operation, um, nursing medical and perhaps other staff? So that's to where that the system. flexibility comes in, Shabir. For, sure. an, for one operational manager, they can handle a, a part of the hospital that houses 64 beds. Right. But the operational manager, depending on the acuity level of the patient, so we've divided right. our patients into different areas. So if yeah. you have an, an acutely ill patient, who needs high flow oxygen, who needs uh, extra nursing care. So the high flow area needs someone with a little a, a professional nurse in a, in, a, in a greater ratio than if, you, if you're looking at your comorbidity patients. So you've got to look at your nurse ratios. So the, right. the, and that's why the operational managers are so important because they allow you to get your nurse to patient ratio right. Yeah, T take just the, uh, the, 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 the priority two or the, the, the second group that Klaus said is the majority. What is that standard? I, uh, I, let's just, let's I, I don't know, do you just know the, offhand. the ratios offhand? I think this is why the it, operational it, nurse managers are so important, uh, Shabir. Yeah, no, no, Once, it's fine. If you don't have it, yeah. no deal. But uh, I, I don't thank have you. It offhand, no. But, uh, but, but the point is that you've got, to, you've got to get your operational managers and then mm. define what your minimum unit is 
and then that's you look right. at an expansion plan based on that minimum unit. Yeah, no, I and think that's super, super idea. Yeah, and I think that you know that insight of the numbers exactly will be very helpful to us to actually say, listen, this is how we organize ourselves, and not and just manage what we can manage with what we have, and then build on that based on success. So thanks, thanks for that. Yes, Steve. Um, Shabir, um, I think it's important just to speak to uh, Tom's frustrations. Yes. To uh, define the level of care that um, the that is needed in the metro in the in Gauteng, um, very uh, carefully, and it's only in week was it two or three that we actually um, uh, came to articulate this overall aim of the hospital, and the essential. Part of it is the middle line in response to the needs in the Cape Town Metropole. And we've seen how important it is to be very responsive to what's going on in the other hospitals. So uh, the big hospitals were overflowing. They were running like crazy. Uh, and what we've managed to do is, is decant their less sick patients to here, still on oxygen right. when they needed it, but um, taking the uh, uh, load off so that they could actually accept more patients uh, who are who are uh, a little bit sicker. So defining right. so that, this, this that is what we were going to see. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. the kind of uh, just say that was that is what I was thinking is, uh, and I've discussed this with the heads with people at the big three hospitals, um, and I'm in close contact with them. So the idea would be to take patients who've got a confirmed diagnosis and um, are stabilised and um, require oxygen and basically those things I said. So I said, so that, that was our plan. Yeah, so, so what Nasrik sounds like is, is a basically an isolation facility as opposed to a sort of intermediate level. Um, uh, but the current, the, yeah, yeah, with, yeah, yeah. with oxygen. And the oxygen, current set setup is a, is, a, is a cohorting for patients who don't need oxygen just to prevent infection, yeah. basically. So that's, yeah, I think that's no that's, value to us, really. No so great so oxygen is the, is the currency of, of yes. this disease. It's what everybody needs. And you, yes. you need it in big numbers at a yeah. reasonable flow rate. Um, yeah, so the, the, yeah. the agreement so far is that we're going to, because the beds aren't full of their isolate, their, um, their isolation unit that's actually not providing oxygen, is very, uh, essentially is just um, providing a bed for people to sleep on and pretty much not much else. Yeah is that we'll take over some of those beds and provide oxygen and manage only the beds that we're taking over. So we're, okay. we're not going to be running the whole facility. We're just going to be, for this intermediate time, we're, we're going to be taking over a portion of the facility that's going to be run as an intermediate care unit. Yeah. So let me ask this question, uh, um, Steve, and perhaps other team, is um, you've mentioned high flow nasal oxygen. What percentage um, do you'll have there? And if we were to strip that out um, as a need, in other words, to keep it really uh, off a low base, what would you suggest in terms of uh, patient um, burden or acuity uh, to focus ourselves on? I mean, that's one thing we've said, listen, I think Thomas said high flow nasal oxygen, no need way. that for the hospital. We're yeah. just gonna be delivering oxygen. What sort of um, uh, flows are we talking about? What are the volumes we're looking at for this hospital that we should be saying, listen, this is what needs to be in place if we start for that 64 bed or individual patient? So just to, to, to say that initially when the hospital was commissioned, mm -hmm. it was uh, conceptualized as a COVID intensive facility. We would, we, we, we would have say, even severe COVID cases needing okay. high flow. However, okay. the needs of the platform changed our admission criteria. So I think what Steve was saying earlier, if you speak constantly with the, the acute hospitals, that does uh, kind of shape your service. We have an 11 o'clock meeting every single day, seven days a week across our platform uh, where we are testing uh, the, the, the acute services all the time. So that's the first thing. In terms of oxygen requirements, uh, our, pipe, our standard bed can deliver a max of 15 liters per minute. So that That's allows for, yeah, 15 liters per minute. So there are, there's a subset uh, of patients piped. who need what I learned, what I came to learn here about barrel, double barrel oxygen. 
So they have nasal prongs and a, and a non rebreather. <laughs> so it seems to work. And then I think the positional uh, component is also quite important. Um, to be honest, we, so we don't accept patients from other facilities who specifically need high flow nasal oxygen. Those are only for those patients who are needing escalation of care once they've been admitted here already. Okay. We must remember that escalation comes with its own tremendous ethical issues. And our m, &M last week, uh, we had Mark Lockman talking about uh, the beginning of an escalation plan. And if we don't have an ICU bed available for that patient, at what point do we decide in a convention center that we are going to withdraw uh, maximum treatment? Mm -hmm. So the high flow nasal oxygen is contentious in this space. There are ethical issues and there are clinical pathway issues that one would have to consider. So I certainly would say, eight, eight yeah, we, we've Don't got eight and the new facility has a further eight. So high flow nasal yeah. oxygen, think very hard and very carefully about Okay, it. so I mean, let's just move on from that because uh, yeah. I think there's zero chance we're going to have high flow nasal oxygen right. at NASRAQ ever. Right. So I think yeah, the other question be is, and I think that is uh, quite useful, is you have a, a conversation every day with all the acute hospitals in the metro. Um, right. is, that, uh, is that working well? And... Are people responsive? How did that get set up? Because that's one of the key issues we need to It was get set up happening. by disaster management and it's been running since we started operating. It okay. is a life-saving mechanism for our entire system. Okay. It's probably one of the most important interventions that we've had because on a daily basis, on, on, on the one hand, we have this daily conversation and there's something called the bed bureau, which was written in a circular and so it was, uh, in, it was gazetted uh, two weeks ago in the provincial government. The bed bureau is an electronic uh, barometer for where okay. the pressures are. The beds are available. Okay. Yeah, so availability of beds across the platform. Uh, and the 11 o'clock meeting that we have is a qualitative uh, discussion of that same numbers. Okay. So that's what, been- We have none of that. That's the problem. We have no disaster management. We have no bed bureau. Yeah. Well, yeah, we'll, have the, to, we'll have to look at creating that and perhaps you'll, yeah. you can just share with us. So you've got a, a virtual meeting. What's the agenda? If I may just The agenda ask. is just, a, it, it's just basically a round of clinical managers or senior uh -huh. clinicians from each hospital saying where uh -huh. their key uh, pressures are. Sorry. So they would say, okay. I've got X amount of COVID beds. This is my capacity. Uh, okay. I've got so many people waiting in the EC, in my COVID EC, my non-COVID EC. Right. Um, and then from the CTICC <clears throat> side, we will then say, right, we've got so much staff on the floor, we can handle so much admissions. Right. And EMS would then say, okay, fine, so we understand this hospital is under pressure, we're going to divert most of our ambulances there. So it's a, it is a team effort. And I think that that, okay. that collaborative approach has really helped us. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, Tom, uh, our, problem, our problem on this side is that we have to create a parallel process because the command center thinks they have that in place but it's completely inaccurate. And the way they run it is through a data capturer that sits in each hospital that in no way communicates with a clinician who fills in essentially phantom fictitious beds. So in a way they think they have that, but it's completely inaccurate and not reliable. So it's almost like we have to create a parallel system next to it, um, which is obviously again, politically a hot potato because they think they have it, even though it's um, in no way useful to anybody. Yeah, I mean, look, so even though we, we have something in place, it's not completely accurate. It's a, it's a work in progress. And when we started, uh, we needed to have <laughs> several very, very hard conversations with colleagues. You know, and they had hard conversations with us. So we didn't shy away from having the hard conversations because I think the, the bigger picture forced us all to kind of step back and say, okay, fine, you know, there's enough room in the sun for, for all of us. Uh, it it was we need initial to, we need to, start up, uh, lots of yeah, I think we need to take, take that conversation up and certainly that is a good idea. So uh, let me just quickly answer some, ask some of the questions that people have raised uh, in the group as well. Uh, Shanaz asked about how many oxygen ports and, and, and we've clarified that it's basically all your, all your points, your beds have oxygen. I think uh, the other question Richard has asked is that, is that all piped or do you, are you using oxygen concentrators? Um, is there a challenge with us using concentrators? Do you mind just sharing an answer to that? Uh, because yeah. that's what we look to be doing right now because... Maybe I can just, just intervene there. So yeah, the, 800 beds will, the 800 beds are planned to have piped oxygen at, at 
15 litres, no concentrators. The, eight, the six, 600 beds which are sitting there, we are attempting, I've discussed it with Eric Gomer at, at, at Kailicha, and we are attempting to access oxygen concentrators because there will, ne there will never be piped oxygen in the 600 beds. It, it's never going to happen. So we're having concentrators there. Okay, okay. and, and uh, yes. what are your thoughts on that? Um, so the, the Kailicha experience, which is an MSF-run hospital, has been pretty good with the, with the oxygen concentrators. Uh, they're running at full capacity, and they've really decongested Kailicha District Hospital. Yeah. You know, excellent. I've discussed it with them, um, yeah, and they've advised yeah. concentrators. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, 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 I think that initially there were so, some challenges so, with procurement, but, I, but Tom will, will, will have the inner workings of that. Procurement's yeah. a challenge. Yeah. Sure. And I think that we'll look at that. So I think that would be useful as, a, as the short-term measure in, um, in uh, Nazareth. I think the other question Michelle asks, Michelle Toluta, is what is the, what is the need for the additional services, uh, x-rays and bloods being done? Perhaps you can just talk about your x-rays. Um, do you see that as an essential part? Um, what sort of half measures might we do? Just a quick question on that. Yeah. 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 Clinically, I mean, yeah. I imagine I mean, you are. So, you so, need that if we are taking down referrals. Yeah. So, so, I mean, we obviously. So, if you think of half measures and uh, making a compromise in in what is ne necessary, I mean, the X-rays do add value. Um, I mean, most of the patients that come in already have had their X-rays at their base hospital. Um, so, but certain. So one. Could argue that a point of care ultrasound could potentially be the way to go, but it, it does add a, a great a great value to have mobile X-rays available. So even if you have one machine, um, certain hours during the, during the office hours, it may it may add value. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I think the other question uh, that came around in the in the group is in the chat group. Norbert Foster asks the question is said, well done to all of you. I'm sure you can read that, but he asked the question, have you been able to benchmark against international standards, perhaps including your case fatality rate um, and otherwise? Uh, I know that, you know, the, you know, it's Apple's not always easy to compare, but uh, if there's any, be, any be, you know, reference to international examples and lessons that you think worth sharing or that you're really busy grappling with. Yeah, so we, we've had a, a call with the, um, uh, people in Scotland actually who set up these field hospitals in a convention center, uh, one in Glasgow and the Nightingale hospitals in the, in, in, uh, in the UK. Um, they uh, didn't actually need them in the end uh, to any great, it didn't use them. They had also these huge numbers of beds with oxygen, etc. But I think they only had a couple of hundred patients through there. But they had very good systems up and running, and, and they gave us some very good advice in that first week, uh, particularly about, about rapid learning and rapid uh, um, adaptation, which I think has been the, the fundamental uh, process. You know, everyone coming into the space has realized, hey, we've got to, we've got to change our uh, assumptions almost daily um, in response to what's happening, our, our protocols, our you know, uh, whatever it is, uh, clinical protocols, prednisone, uh, high flow nasal oxygen, we're all learning uh, on, a, uh, on, a, on a daily basis. Um, yeah. So that was helpful, maybe just um, in terms of, okay, you guys have, they, 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 had, they had been through the similar process maybe a month before. Uh, so in a way, similar to the way that we're speaking now, Based on our experience, they were um, uh, helping us to to think about how to how to set it up. Uh, Steve, do you mind just shifting the slides to the sort of learning one, the, the learning um, conversations? Which yeah, this this one that you just passed now, uh, the yeah. the sort of schedule of visits that you have, the schedule of meetings. Uh, um, next one. Yeah, that one. So, yeah. can you just tell us? I mean, in a little more detail about. What's the sort of day like, um, you know, on, on a, let's take a Monday. Tell us what that means, just so that we have a sense of what your day looks like. Any one okay. of you. Um, so, so a typical day obviously starts off with um, the team 
the day team coming on, on, on board starting at eight o'clock, uh, the nursing starting at seven o'clock, uh, meeting in the, in the, so on, on our parking level, we have, they change into scrubs and, and, and or bring their own scrubs and then they go onto the ground floor, uh, go through the donning area and then meet in their clinical team. So the eight clinical teams is one in admissions and the other seven are in the, in the wards. Um, and within those clinical teams, there's also often the physiotherapist and, and, and the nursing component uh, involved. And then they have a, a structured way of checking in, um, uh, looking at some personalia, uh, issues from the night, hand, specific handover. They've got two groups of patients that they would flag, the red flag patients that need have sp special care or attention. Um, and then there's a, what the other kind of green, green flag for those patients who are deemed fit to be discharged. So the discharge process can be started. Um, yeah, and then, then they go about basically in each row. There's a How team. long does it last, if I may ask? That so the hello, 10, 15 uh, minutes. Yeah, 10, 15. short, okay. 15 minutes. Let, yeah. let, let me say, though, that it wasn't always like this. Yeah. For the first two weeks, it was chaos. And after two weeks, we actually, we actually got teams to stay in the same ward for more than a day, yeah. including the medical and the nursing staff. So for the first two weeks, people were all over the place. And it was, oh, it was just, nuts. Yeah. Uh, and because we, we were trying to follow the patients that, that we had admitted before, and the patients were all over the place and being moved. Oh, oh. So what class is presenting, it looks, sounds nice, <laughs> but actually <laughs> it took two weeks to get there. Yeah. And then we said, okay, so. This medical team, this nursing team is going to look after this ward. Uh, row, 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 a row, row of beds, of yeah. 60 Good. beds. And yes. that, that actually brought quite a lot of... Uh, how, how did the handover occur? Because I'm curious, you know, if you have three, 400 beds as you got and six different teams, is it the handover, you know, is, that, is the handover, the, the night staff going to sort of delegate themselves to say, listen, let's go hand over each team's patients? How does that work? I'm just curious about you yeah, know, the so, flag. So the handover happens with the huddles. Um, and there's obviously the, the WhatsApp group. And there's also uh, whiteboards um, with, with whiteboard markers in each row where the, okay. the specific team have highlights certain uh, patients that uh, are either have to be escalated or observed. Um, yes. So, but what I mean, the WhatsApp groups is is a uh, is is very key. Yeah. Uh, that has made a tremendous difference because people that's the only that's the main way of communicating with the team. And then every okay. day with the shift change, so there's a team also starting. Is it from twelve? No, ten. Two. 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 Sorry. Two. Two. Two to ten. So there's an eight to four. Uh, two to ten, and then an eight overnight. Those okay. three so shifts all, all is a free system. Okay, so each team hands over, so there's a team for each, each ward, and that team hands over to the next one, so each ward runs its own circuit. Yes, so, so within the same team, the people are coming in at different times of the day, uh, and they are responsible for, for, a, for a certain row of beds. For example, there's also one team that's dedicated to looking at the palliative care patients. Um, yeah. And so across, the, the, across the board the team. It turns to have uh, be on, on call for each night. So they may be on call for a, they, not, not necessarily their own team, but for the, the team that's on that night. Um, and at four o'clock or quarter to four each day, there's a consultant handover also. Uh, but it's also recent. I think like, like Steve has alluded, um, this is ongoing learning, a rapid uh, cycle of, of, of implementing new interventions and one of the interventions was to, um, I mean, this week was that there's a quarter to four handover from consultants of the red flag patients. And that the double barrel patients are grouped together close to the high flow nasal area, which is the high risk uh, or high acuity area. Um, so that's just uh, some organizational aspects. Good. Now we've run to the hour, so unfortunately our time's run out. Um, really appreciate you guys spending the time and energy uh, with us. Thanks, Tom, for leading the questions and, and inter you know, for providing some focus to this. Um, thank you all very much. We've had uh, quite a few listeners, uh, quite a few people tuning into this. 
uh, please uh, you be to get the slides and the recording after this. Uh, once again, thank you all very much for attending and thanks Klaus and the team and Tom for joining us. Take care, be safe. Thanks, Shabir.